Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, Andy. It's a pleasure to have you with us here in this webinar organized by the Argentina chapter of the ACS. Eh, todos conocen al doctor Warshaw, pero yo me permití, en atención a la amistad que tengo con él desde hace mucho tiempo, de hacer una introducción más formal. Eh, acá tienen algunos de los antecedentes del doctor Warshaw. Eh, en 1997 se hizo cargo del Departamento de Cirugía. Eh, posiblemente el doctor Walsh no se acuerda, pero tuve la suerte de conocerlo en 1991 eh, y a partir de ahí tuve un lazo de amistad con él y con, junto con el doctor Carlos Fernández del Castillo. Probably Andy will not remember, but I met you for the first time at the OR at Machener in 1991 when I was an international guest scholar of the college. At that, that moment, you introduced me to Carlos Fernandez del Castillo and one, on, on one of his lab assistants named Yuma from India. Uh, from that moment on, we have been very good friends. El doctor uh, Warshaw se retiró como profesor emérito y jefe de cirugía emérito y, y es el director del Instituto Warshaw para la investigación en cáncer de páncreas. I will mention some of your accolades. El doctor Warshaw ha sido presidente de todas esas asociaciones que ustedes ven en la pantalla. Y el, el hito más importante lo marcó haber sido nombrado presidente del American Culture Surgeons. Here we can see Andy when he was inducted as president of the ACS. And I remember and I recall that night in San Francisco, very, very, very firmly in, in a very good shape. That was uh, yeah. October 27th. And the reason was that when Andy was appointed and inducted as president of the ACS, uh, I was on the stage because at that day I was inducted by immediate past president Dr. Pellegrini as an honorary fellow of the college. So, uh, Dr. Warshaw también ha descrito la operación que lleva su nombre. This is the original uh, report published in Archives of Surgery. Esta es la, la publicación original de la operación de Warshaw y ha sido reconocido como un líder de la cirugía pancreática, como lo demuestra este eh, volumen de surgery de, diciembre, de septiembre del 2012, dedicado a, en honor del doctor Walsh y dirigido por Carlos Fernández del Castillo y otro gran amigo, el doctor Mike Sarr. Y acá recibiendo el fellowship honorario del Royal College of Surgeons de mm, Edimburgo, uh, junto con el Dr. Rowan Parks, un gran amigo que me ha facilitado la foto. This photo was sent to me by Rowan Parks when I was uh, putting together all this presentation. He's very close friend to me, to you as well as to me. Uh, el Dr. Warsho disfruta y se encuentra actualmente en su casa de Martha's Vineyard, una pequeña isla en la zona de Cape Cod, y es un excelente anfitrión y cosa de la buena vida, y acá ustedes ven al doctor Cameron, a la doctora Barbara Bass, a Courtney Townsend, eh, al doctor, al, al doctor eh, el secretario ejecutivo del American College, y, y pasando, esto fue el año pasado, y acá otras fotos también con las autoridades del college y un, con un gran amigo mío. Por eso digo que es un honor y un privilegio poder presentar a mí. It's a real honor and a privilege to introduce a good friend of mine. Disfrute de la buena vida, como ustedes pueden ver en esta fotografía. Eh, nos intoxicamos con langosta. We, we ate lobster every single day we were there. Y también tuvo oportunidad el doctor Warsho de visitar la Argentina, su participación activa en el 86 Congreso Argentino de Cirugía y en esta fotografía junto al profesor Carlos Pellegrini pero también pudo disfrutar un poco de, 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 de la vida social y acá en un show de tango y acá junto con los doctores Michelazzi, Patti y Pellegrini. So, uh, Andy, it's a great honor for me to introduce you as the keynote speaker in, in this webinar organized by the ACS and thank you so much for your friendship and your, your willingness to give this talk. It was not difficult to convince you. So, a todos, un, un gran reconocimiento al doctor Warshaw por su gentileza y su rápida aceptación de poder darnos esta charla inaugurando el módulo HPV del seminario La Opinión de los Expertos, organizado por el capítulo argentino del American College. Andy, yeah. go ahead and make your presentation. I'm leaving mine. Okay.
Well, Good. first of all, first of all, thank you, Alberto. Uh, you are a a good friend, an old friend, and, and I very much enjoyed uh, that trip down memory lane with those photographs. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a, a great honor for me to have this uh, chance to present uh, uh, an overview of surgery for pancreatic cancer. Uh, Dr. Maza, Dr. Serrato, members of the, uh, of the uh, chapter, uh, thank you for having me here. So what I'm going to try to do is to give you, as I said, an, an overview, overview, a sense of where we are with pancreatic cancer and perhaps uh, where some of the openings for the future uh, may lie. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So these comments, I think, are, are a start. Uh, despite how, how, much, how far we think we have come, how much our health systems have evolved uh, in trying to uh, take care of patients with pancreatic cancer, um, a fifth of them, 20% or more, receive no treatment at all. Now, some of that is due to uh, a sense of nihilism, uh, doctors who, uh, who say, I have never seen anybody cured from pancreatic cancer. The treatment is worth, worse than the disease, so they don't refer them for treatment. Some of it is due to the fact that they may be in uh, geographical areas that are, uh, that are difficult uh, to access treatment, uh, and uh, travel and expense is too much. And even if they get to a center for treatment, uh, only about a third at present receive modern multimodality therapy. Uh, most striking is this study uh, from uh, 2018, which shows uh, that, um, that more than half of patients who are potential candidates for surgical resection, uh, they have no contraindications, either health-wise or evidence of metastatic disease, actually get resected. So these, these patients are being left behind. That even uh, early stage patients uh, who do get treatment, uh, they're, uh, depending upon the institution, there are major differences in what kind of treatment they get. Uh, and at least in this country, uh, that unfortunately is associated with elements of socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, and so on. And that can translate into the chance for survival. Those who do get an operation, uh, where they get it and, and who they get it from uh, differs. And there is increasing uh, a tendency or increasing skill set for providing minimally invasive uh, pancreatic oduodenectomy, Whipple operation, uh, either by laparoscopic or robotic techniques. Uh, what we know about that so far is that, at least in most hands, it takes longer for the minimally invasive approach. The 30-day mortality is similar. There is a lower surgical site infection with the, uh, with the minimally invasive approach. Other complications are similar. Length of stay uh, is perhaps lower uh, smaller and the shorter in the minimally invasive uh, group, but there is a higher readmission rate for whatever reason. A major issue uh, about surgical uh, treatment of pancreatic cancer is where it is done. And there is considerable uh, evidence uh, that centralization to high volume settings, whether high volume hospital or high volume surgeon, uh, result, uh, you know, uh, uh, incurs a lower operative mortality uh, and a greater likelihood of having an R0 resection and a, a complete lymph node dissection, an adequate lymph node dissection. Hospitalization is shorter and the long-term survival has been shown to be better in these centralized uh, high volume settings. However, because many of these patients travel long distances, uh, from their home to the, to the hospital or to the treatment center, they are less likely to receive chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And obviously there are increased costs for transportation, disruption of life and the social support uh, in, their, in their communities. This is an observation you may not have seen. 
since many of these patients now with, uh, with carcinoma of the head of the pancreas get stented, uh, over time there is colonization, bacterial colonization uh, uh, in the biliary tree. Uh, in the upper left, the graph shows that the more, uh, back, more different strains of bacteria uh, that are in the bile, the shorter, the long-term survival. This is not due to infection, but this is due to a series of, uh, of uh, effects that, that uh, we do not anticipate. For example, um, K, uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia is one of the most common uh, pathogens, and Klebsiella pneumonia actually has metabolically deactivates gemcitabine. So it actually interferes with the chemotherapy. Uh, also, uh, common treatment of, of these bacteria is with quinolone antibiotics. Uh, and aside from, uh, from treating the infection, uh, the quinolone molecules actually uh, affect, affect the cell cycle of the pancreatic cancer. So it actually is another form of chemotherapy that we had not anticipated. And that, that translates into, as you see in these other three graphs, to greater survival in uh, quinolone-treated patients, especially if their primary bacteria is the Klebsiella. Now, we all would like to uh, find pancreatic cancer early. You know, it's sort of a, uh, it's sort of a truth that the uh, earlier you can find it, the, the better the chance of, of cure, uh, although that doesn't work out completely, uh, as I'll show you. Uh, at the moment, imaging tests, whether it's CT, MRI, PET, uh, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, basically can find tumors maybe one centimeter, maybe a little bit less, but that does not necessarily mean it's an early cancer. And what we would like to be able to do is to, is to have a marker, a biomarker, a circulating biomarker uh, that can pick up uh, pancreatic cancer at even earlier uh, stages. Uh, we don't have that yet. I'll come back to that in a moment. And what we're left with is really looking at high-risk populations uh, where surveillance, uh, frequency of surveillance uh, makes more sense because the chance of, of of uh, picking up the cancer are, uh, are you know, the statistical uh, probabilities are that much greater. So there's a great deal of interest about circulating tumor cells uh, as an early marker uh, for pancreatic cancer. And I, I bring this up mainly to give you a caveat, a, a be careful type of statement. Uh, on the left, you see circulating tumor cells from pancreatic cancer in the bloodstream of a patient. On the right, you see uh, cells that look identical, cannot be distinguished morphologically from patients with chronic pancreatitis. And we see that in other pancreatic diseases as well. So simply having some kind of a sieve that collects these cells uh, does not tell us that it's pancreatic cancer. And we are, we are looking at looking for uh, molecular markers. If we see these cells, is there some kind of, of um, antibody, for example, that can, can tell whether it's a cancer cell or simply something that has arisen in chronic pancreatitis? Uh, those studies are ongoing now. They're promising, but they're not ready for prime time. The other, uh, other uh, potential source of finding these uh, would be for panins. Uh, as you know, panins are very common, uh, as uh, panin one uh, in three quarters of, of people uh, at autopsy, uh, but only the panin three, which is much more, much less common, uh, has actually been tied uh, uh, to progression to pancreatic cancer. Uh, these panin 3s uh, are increased uh, after age 70 and increased in diabetics. But you know, while we would like to have an imaging test to find them, they are microscopic, multifocal, uh, and uh, although they are potential bad actors, uh, we don't have any way to find them other than post-operatively. So that's, that so far is, a, uh, is un, an unfruitful way. Uh, Patients with IPMNs, you are well aware uh, that, uh, that a form of cancer of ductal adenocarcinoma, which can look 
uh, indistinguishable from standard pancreatic ductal carcinoma, uh, arises with substantial frequency in patients with IPMNs, uh, most commonly or more commonly in the main duct ver variety uh, than in the branch duct. But uh, the main thing I wanted to point out here is that, uh, that uh, other uh, pancreatic ductal carcinoma not associated with, with the IPMNs is more likely uh, to occur in patients who have IPMNs. Uh, on average, about 7% of uh, patients with IPMNs uh, will, are, are at risk for a coincidence of separate pancreatic ductal carcinoma probably related to a similar genetic background, a similar genetic uh, soil, if you will, uh, KRAS among others, but, but multiple genes that give rise to both. So they are a group that needs surveillance even after you have resected the IPMN. The residual pancreas is at risk of ductal carcinoma. Well known, of course, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, that, uh, that uh, diabetes is uh, more common uh, in patients with pancreatic cancer, but, and as you also know, uh, more, more common in uh, diabetes that has a new onset within the last year or two. What I mean to show in this slide is something different, which is uh, new uh, information that in patients with diabetes, whether or not it's new onset, that the, the behavior, the biology of the pancreatic cancer is worse in diabetics than in non-diabetics. That in diabetes, the, the tumors tend to be larger, lymph nodes more likely to be positive, uh, perineural invasion more likely, 30-day mortality, but even more important, median overall survival uh, in, a, in a diabetic patient is significantly statistically uh, and clinically important, uh, lower uh, uh, even in the presence of neoadjuvant therapy. So it's, it's uh, I, I can't tell you to make them not diabetic, but it, it, it is something to be aware of. Now this slide I think is, uh, is, is in my mind quite striking. Look down at the lower left and you will see that pancreas cancer uh, according to this study, um, which was in the Lancet five years ago, has, as we know, the lowest cure rate or lowest uh, five-year survival of any of the cancers shown on this slide. What is more striking is that, this, that going from left to right, these are, are is the amount of, of change in uh, successful um, prolongation of life uh, over the last 50 years which means that pancreas cancer not only has the lowest five-year survival, but it has remained the lowest. That seems to be changing a bit uh, as, we, as we look at uh, that same 50-year uh, period. Uh, and the slight increase in the first uh, 30 years or so uh, may be related to uh, uh, lowering the mortality of the operation so more patients are alive to potentially survive. But the, the inflection uh, in the last uh, uh, 15 years or so uh, may probably be due to uh, the improvements in, uh, in chemotherapy. And that's where I want to turn to for the moment. This is the study uh, of Fulfirinox, which is, uh, you know, I think at least in our institution, the favored uh, uh, chemotherapy regimen used in the adjuvant setting, post-operative. Uh, and the slide, the, the curves compare Fulfirinox with gemcitabine, which of course uh, is that uh, been around for longer. Uh, clearly, Fulfirinox outperforms gemcitabine in the adjuvant setting. Now, new information, relatively speaking. We look at a small tumor, let's say a, a one, what we think is a, is a uh, stage one, you know, one centimeter, uh, gonna be very easy to take care of this. Uh, and we make that judgment on the basis of the, uh, of the CT scan primarily. Uh, it turns out that, that when the spe specimen is resected, only something slightly more than a quarter, 25% of patients remain truly 
pathologically stage one. And almost three quarters of them uh, turn out to have positive nodes that were not suspected, turn out to be bigger than, than had been shown on the CT scan. Uh, and basically a much more advanced tumor that, than we had anticipated. This is uh, clinically significant because patients who have a true stage one in the upper curve uh, compared with those, uh, that is a pathologic uh, stage one verified uh, in the upper curve, uh, have a signif significantly improved survival uh, over those that we thought were stage one, but turned out not to be. The implication for treatment is that if clinical staging does not appear to be reliable in predicting pathologic stage, and if in fact clinical staging tends to understage the disease, then the implication for, for on, on our treatment decisions based on what we think are early pancreatic cancers uh, may be uh, incorrect and uh, adds a uh, justification for, for using neoadjuvant therapy in all pancreas cancer patients, not just those with more advanced disease. So you all know this. Why, what, what are the goals of neoadjuvant therapy? We want to increase the R0 resection rates. Uh, it would be nice if we could convert unresectable, whether borderline resectable or locally advanced uh, cancer to potentially resectable disease. Um, Presumably, we, we would be treating occult systemic disease when it was smaller uh, at an earlier time. Uh, and since some patients, the biology of some is so bad that despite uh, the uh, uh, chemotherapy, uh, they progress rapidly. Uh, and uh, as Doug Evans has shown for many years, uh, in those patients, we would not proceed to an operation that in fact would be futile. So it would it would, um, it would not make things worse in that sense. We know that from various studies, including this one from our institution, that disease-free survival uh, is better uh, after operation uh, uh, in those patients who have received neoadjuvant treatment. Uh, that's, they're not, there's nothing new uh, or surprising in that. One uh, surprise, however, is that those patients who have received neoadjuvant treatment uh, uh, have a substantially lower clinically relevant a chance of clinically relevant pancreatic fistula, uh, as seen in the in the lower bar, uh, and compared with those that that uh, that had upfront resection. Whether this is due to uh, increased uh, uh, harder pancreas that that, uh, that that holds stitches better or whether it the uh, secretory capacity of the pancreas has been reduced by the neoadjuvant treatment uh, take your pick but in any case it's an added benefit of neoadjuvant treatment so if it works in uh, in early stage stage one uh, or two uh, uh, cancers uh, what about extending it to the borderline resectable? Now, this is a study that, again, from our institution that showed uh, uh, in the bottom part of the graph, uh, median disease-free survival, median overall survival, two-year survival, and so on, very much improved in those patients who were resected. But to me, the most striking aspect of this study is that uh, in borderline resectable patients treated with uh, neoadjuvant fulfirinox, and we happen to add radiation, the R0 resection rate was 65%. That is really, you know, that's a, that's a, a major advance. Uh, and those patients are, we think, more likely, uh, as, as shown by these data, to have long-term survival. Now, I want to make a comment about the stroma in pancreatic cancer. This is, this is the dense fi desmoplastic fibrotic uh, structures that surround the cancer cells. It's the, the only other, other cancer that really has this kind of stroma is, uh, can be breast cancer. It really is not true of, of you know, colon or stomach or whatever. The, the, uh, this um, stroma uh, is in part the result of activation of TGF-beta, which stimulates 
uh, extracellular matrix proteins, uh, which uh, in turn contributes to a pathologic excess of tissue fibrosis. The drug Losartan, uh, which suppresses active TGF beta, uh, actually has a major effect on that stroma. This slide shows um, the, um, the stroma, that is the, the, the collagen, uh, a dense collagen in blue, and the green are blood vessels, uh, the, the microvasculature of the cancer, pre-Losartan and after Losartan. And what you see is that, that the, the fibrotic stroma has been greatly reduced. The blood vessels are now able to permeate the area. And one uh, leading theory of why uh, this, these, um, why uh, Losartan can uh, improve uh, treatment of chemotherapy is that the chemotherapy can now reach the cancer more effectively uh, since, since the block by the fibrosis is less. And this is simply a study showing survival with or without Losartan. Uh, and you, the green is the Losartan treated patients with the longer survival. So if it works for uh, borderline re resectable, why not move on to, uh, to locally advanced uh, uh, un and, and presumably unresectable cancer, uh, cancer that uh, surrounds uh, the, the major blood vessels, portal vein, uh, 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 the superior mesenteric artery, and so on, uh, you know, the, the really mean-looking bulky tumors. Uh, here again, uh, treatment with fulfirinox and losartan with, uh, in our institution, radiation uh, has, uh, again, demonstrably uh, shown uh, an extension of median disease-free survival, median overall survival, uh, to a significant uh, level, and once again striking. You know, here this these are tumors that that one would have said are are unresectable because they're so extensive locally, uh, and the R zero resection rate uh, in this set in this series was 61 percent, uh, which means, uh, and, and you will be hearing this from uh, from Dr. Ferroni and Dr. Uh, Fernandez del Castillo in, uh, in next week's session, but uh, it basically, uh, it, uh, it came about saying, okay, we have to operate on these patients to find out if it still is truly unresectable or whether the, uh, the cancer uh, has essentially been killed, uh, uh, reduced in size. And what we're seeing in the, in the CT scan, while it may still look unresectable, is just fibrosis. And we did a study uh, that, uh, that showed um, that, the, that blinded, one could not tell the difference uh, between pre and post-operative uh, 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 CT scans in many cases, and one could not make an, a, an, an accurate judgment about whether uh, the, the cancer was resectable. I'll, if you can see my cursor, this is this is the residual uh, after uh, after uh, treatment, uh, and you know one would I think everybody would say that's not resectable, but uh, but by going in and finding out and basically if you will chipping it out uh, and doing a serial um, a pathology, it's all fibrosis and not cancer. And many of these patients had a, despite what the CT showed, a pathologic uh, complete response or nearly complete response as shown in, in this uh, particular slide. So the, the um, take home from this, the observation, at least the way we feel about it is, if we cannot reliably predict who's going to have an R0, N0 resection based on the CT scan after neoadjuvant treatment, all resectable and what we think are unresectable patients should undergo, uh, first of all, should have gone undergone preoperative therapy, but then uh, after it, uh, all of them should be explored to access and, and see whether the patients are resectable or uh, if, if, uh, if, it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but 60% uh, are gonna be able to be uh, treated this way. Now, the various neoadjuvant treatments uh, most commonly used are, as we've said, fulfirinox. And the other one that, uh, that is very commonly used is 
uh, gemcitabine, but with, with NAB paclitaxel. Various studies have shown uh, essentially identical survival curves uh, for, for each of these uh, two um, uh, therapeutic uh, programs. So how do you choose? I mean, does it matter? Uh, is you flip a coin and just use one or the other? It's the, the, the answer is that these are different patient sets. That what we found is that patients who will respond to fulfirinox don't necessarily respond at all to the GNP protocol and vice versa. So at the moment, we do not have a way other than what the institutional um, bias is, uh, what you happen to do at your hospital. Uh, we don't have a way to say this patient should get fulfirinox, that one should get, GN get the, uh, the, the gemcitabine based treatment. We need a test uh, to do that. And we are working on a, uh, a, a test which uses uh, cell lines de derived from biopsies uh, to be able to predict that. What this is telling us is that that not all pancreatic cancer is the same. You know, we, we, sort of, we sort of know that intuitively. But in fact, there are subtypes of pancreatic ductal carcinoma based on <clears throat> their genetic and molecular characteristics uh, that respond differently to different therapies. Uh, there are, we are now getting smart about uh, genomic analyses to identify those molecular subtypes so that treatment can be appropriately adapted to that patient, personalized medicine. Uh, and uh, furthermore, even uh, in, in the long-term survivors that who get, who get uh, studied, uh, one can find unique uh, neoantigens uh, in, in those patients at their, from their resected specimen that in fact predict their long-term survival. So we're, there's a lot to learn and, we, and it's coming forward. Um, as we try to identify these unique qualities in long-term survivors, uh, one of them uh, that I, I'll focus on is uh, the increased um, infiltration of CD8 positive T cells uh, in the tumor, in the resected tumor. I might point out that the bottom line here, remember we talked about, about the interaction between uh, bacteria uh, and, um, and the tumor. Uh, and that cross-reactivity in a variety of ways also is of uh, increasing interest. But anyway, the CD8 uh, T cell infiltrates. Uh, it turns out as another benefit of the losartan fulfirinox treatment that pa patients uh, treated in that way uh, have an increased CD8 positive infiltration of immune cells. So if that's an important predictor of survival, uh, we actually can affect that. It's not simply something that is out of our control uh, uh, in this way. What this now uh, has come to is a, uh, a major multi-institutional um, study, a uh, grant, uh, grant that comes from the Stand Up to Cancer. It's a 10 or $15 million grant, uh, uh, which is, um, pointed at locally advanced pancreatic cancer to try to answer some of these questions. So one arm of the study will be fulfirinox with radiation uh, and then surgery. This is all a neoadjuvant program. The second will be fulfirinox with losartan and radiation and then surgery. Uh, and the third is, uh, is fulfir fulfirinox, losartan, uh, and uh, a, a novel uh, immunotherapy uh, um, with nivolumab. Um, this is gonna be a few years, certainly before we know the answer of that, but um, this is where the field is heading. I should mention that, you know, again, what we all know uh, is that pancreatic cancer patients tend to be debilitated. Uh, the disease itself does that. Certainly undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, will add to that and surgery is not easy uh, for these patients. Uh, and so programs of prehabilitation uh, as it being applied to other uh, GI cancers and other, uh, other, uh, area, other uh, debilitated patients um, 
is increasing. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but it's basically uh, to, to uh, get the patient into better shape for the operation uh, with, uh, with various fitness and nutrition um, programs. Uh, we we uh, are again looking at this particularly specifically in pancreatic cancer patients. So the 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 the, the take home lesson uh, again to say it again. You know somebody once told me when you went, when you give a talk you should tell them what you're going to say say it and then tell them what you just said. So I'm going to tell you what I just said, uh, which is that uh, more uh, pancreatic cancer can be cured. Uh, whether it's early stage, borderline resectable, locally advanced, uh, the, what we have now that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago uh, is the ability to increase the R0 rate, uh, to increase uh, survival. Uh, and we don't really know what the end point of that is because these treatments are still relatively new. I'll point out to you that in 1992, if what way you look at these, at these, these uh, graphs is the following. Uh, the bottom half and a little bit more, uh, that is the, the uh, darker blue, those are patients that uh, appear to be uh, still local. That is uh, the light blue on the top, uh, there's obvious met metastatic disease. So this is still the regional disease. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, maybe 15 to 20 percent in green at the bottom uh, actually were candidates for and got resected. And if 20% of those were five-year survivors, that's a, that was 3%. What we have now is it's the same, same uh, 65%, um, 55, 65% of patients who are still regional, not metastatic as best we know. And by current modalities, uh, we can get 50 to 60, percent of those resected, that's the, the group including the orange, then uh, of those, uh, perhaps uh, half uh, will, will uh, get long-term survival from resection. So by comparison, uh, we very much seemingly at least uh, readied these patients for long-term survival. There's a question mark because you know, we, before we before we congratulate ourselves too much uh, by by early survival and by by R zero resection rates, we've got to see how this works out in the long run. I give you this case report really um, to make a different kind of point. This patient should not be alive. Uh, he had a Whipple resection in 1994. A positive margin uh, at the at the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, he got adjuvant treatment, uh, which at that time was uh, mainly 5-FU, perhaps gem, some gemcitabine. Um, and uh, despite what I was expecting, uh, he remained free of disease until 2007 when he had a solitary pulmonary metastasis, which was resected. Uh, he was fine again till 2013. He had a second pulmonary metastasis resected, uh, and he is free of cancer as far as we can tell today, not just 2019. What that says again is that the biology of this tumor is not necessarily predictable. You can have a one centimeter tumor where the patient's dead in six months, and you can have this patient who has no business being alive, but because because we stuck with him and he continued to be treated appropriately, uh, he's still alive. So I think, I think, you know, if I could give this message to the, uh, for the primary care physicians and the gastroenterologists and those who uh, don't refer these patients for treatment, I would like to do that. But we should know that it ain't all the same disease. I'd also love to show those same people this picture. Uh, this is a, a photograph of, uh, of a reunion of pancreatic cancer survivors. Uh, these patients who have had Whipple operations uh, and are long-term survivors. It's, it just simply is a, uh, a statement that says uh, that what we do as surgeons uh, in combination with our, with our oncology con uh, confreres uh, makes a difference. 
So thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, I've given you a lot of personal views here. Uh, I hope that, that my data backs up most of them. Uh, I certainly uh, am grateful to uh, my colleagues uh, in surgery, including Dr. Ferroni and Dr. Fernandez del Castillo, uh, to the research fellows from around the world uh, who have come and helped us uh, to try to uh, work on these problems. Uh, and, um, the, and just being able to be here today uh, to say um, thank you to my friends. Thank you, Alberto, Dr. Mazza, Dr. Serrato. Uh, and uh, I hope that the rest of your, uh, your chapter meeting uh, is a great success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. It was a pleasure to attend a conference that addressed all the aspects of the current management of pancreatic cancer. This was a, a journey through uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, first of all, I, I want to ask you well, an advice, an advice to the young people who think that the laparoscopy have uh, or can improve the treatment of the uh, duodenopancreatectomy. Because uh, you show us that uh, the, it's very controversial, this. What is your advice, like a master of the duodenopancreatectomy, Andrew? I'm sorry, can you tell me what is... The, which is the role of laparoscopic in oh. duodenopancreatectomy at this moment? Because in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, there are young people who, are, who really want to develop this method. And uh, uh, it's very controversial at this moment, or not? Well, first of all, I, uh, I started my talk by saying I don't have any disclosures. My disclosure for the answer to this is that although I uh, started laparoscopic surgery at Mass General, I have never done a laparoscopic pancreatectomy, okay? So my, <coughs> my observations are uh, based on um, what I see around me and uh, what, I, what I think I understand. Um, as I showed you uh, uh, early in the in the talk, um, the there's there at the moment is not much difference between the outcomes of laparoscopic and robotic uh, pancreatectomy. Um, there appears to be, I think, um, it's a different skill set, uh, and the the robotic approach. Uh, may be easier for surgeons to pick up, and it certainly is sexier, if you'll pardon that term. Um, whether it is better uh, is still uncertain. Uh, there, there are some benefits in terms of, of, um, of, the, of patients, uh, in terms of shorter stay and fewer infections. Uh, it is more expensive. Uh, certainly the robotic is. Uh, if the time in the operating room takes longer, it's more expensive. Uh, but I think, um, uh, unlike me, this younger generation um, is increasingly doing everything by minimally invasive techniques, whether laparoscopic or robotic. And you're not going to be able to stop them from doing it. So I think that we are going to see more and more uh, as, as, the, as, it, uh, as it becomes part of their training, um, as, as it is in many places, um, that's going to be the way it's done. Thank you very much, Andrew. <clears throat> Dr. Warsh, I really enjoy your lecture. And when you say this is your personal point of view, I'd rather say that when there's too much information, the most important is the personal point of view of all the information we can get. because somebody has to to make the filter to filter the information for us and in that aspect i will i will i would like you to to make a, not a statement but your personal day by day decision making regarding radiation what's the point of view of, in your institution of the real role of radiation whether alone or whether chemo radiation in the three different settings in the preoperative, when you do, when you do, you decide to do neoadjuvant treatment, you always 
send the patient to chemo radiation? What's the role in the adjuvant, if, it's, if it has, in the adjuvant setting? And what's the role in the intraoperative setting? So let me start with the intraoperative. Uh, we've had a, uh, a long interest um, going back to the mid-70s uh, for using intraoperative radiation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's, I was highly involved in that. The, uh, we hoped that it, that it would make a difference, and it perhaps makes a difference in terms of local control, but not, but not in survival. So uh, we're really not doing that now. Um, there, as, as you know, uh, and as your question imp uh, really implies, uh, there is a, uh, a difference of opinion about radiation, uh, whether or not you need it at all, whether uh, we don't use it alone, um, but whether, whether uh, it has a, uh, an additive effect on chemotherapy. Uh, the Europeans, by and large, do not use it, I think, as I understand it. Uh, we have tended to, uh, but I, I as, as you saw in that, uh, in that stand up to cancer trial that I showed at the end, radiation is going to be part of it. That, um, that will not answer your question because all of the arms will have it. And um, so the fact that, that this major trial in fact includes radiation perhaps uh, tells you what our bias is. Uh, I, I think to be honest, uh, it has one way or the other, radiation has not been proven to be uh, necessary. And uh, those studies have yet to be done with or without radiation. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you very especially, Andy, for accepting this challenge and, and giving this wonderful uh, and very precise and concise uh, lecture an update about the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Really, I really appreciate your, your, your time in putting everything this together. Así que Oscar y Luis, por favor, si cierran. Y muchas gracias a todo el auditorio por participar. Los esperamos el martes próximo de mi parte eh, con la presencia de los doctores eh, Fernández del Castillo y Cristina Ferrone, también del, del Mad General y de Harvard Medical School, discípulos del doctor Andy Walsh. Please, well, Andy, uh, it was a, a great moment with you, and I'm looking forward to have you in, in Buenos Aires the next year. That time I was, I, I will be the, the president of the Argentinian Congress, and it will be a pleasure to have you in, in person in order to share a moment and maybe uh, some good food like uh, Alberto Ferrer like it also. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much again, and see you very soon. I, I am honored and thank you for the invitation for this and for next year. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. I really enjoy and we all enjoy a lot your, your experience. So hope you meet someday soon. Good. If you can travel. Bye bye, Andy. Yes. Thank, you, Brenda. thank you so much. Thank you, Alberto. Buenas noches. Muy buenas noches a todos. Gracias.